German bombardment of Saint Valery on coal continued all night. The whole place was on fire everywhere. Everywhere was burning. Going into St. Valery, you could see the traces going through the air. You had your head up a bit too high. Unfortunately, some of them passed away that way. The strippers were diving down. They were knocking the buildings a bit. We had one old soldier there, and he said, this is curtains for everybody here because we just can't get away. The 51st Highland Division, along with their French allies, were cornered and running out of ammunition. So he had no bullet in the rifle. <laughs> and no bullets in my pocket either. <laughs> we had to get all the spare ammunition from anybody had been killed or wounded. The flotilla which had come to rescue the 51st was still waiting just out of range of the German guns in the English Channel. But as darkness had fallen the night before, so had a thick fog. The rescue needed to be coordinated. The vessels needed to know what each other were doing so they could go in at the appropriate time and embark troops in order rather than in a rush. The only way that most boats in the flotilla had to communicate with each other was using signal lamps. But of course, in fog, these are almost useless, and there's no way to communicate with other ships. Once you get off the coast in darkness and in thick fog, with a bunch of small vessels, all unable to communicate with each other, there was really no chance of getting many of them into San Valery. The flotilla would just have to wait again in hope that the fog would lift and the 51st could hold on for another whole day. 18-year-old Private Don Smith was now in San Valery, alone and severely injured. He'd lost a finger and suffered shrapnel wounds to his head, shoulder and back. Well, I just staggered down into St. Valerie to the centre. We could hear the noise going on, the battle was still going on in the town. But I had to go down because they told me the hospital was there. Oh, I was dazed and tired. I didn't know what to do. It took me all the time to walk. There was civilians running around. There was nobody there to help me. Nobody stopped to, and I was just dragging myself along here. The flipping head was spinning, blood was coming out of the flipping sleeve still it through the bandages they put on. And they the back felt wet where they put the plasters on my shoulder. It was all going through your mind. What the hell is where's the German, you know? And I was my eyes were peeled all over the place. People must realise just how chaotic everything was. Smoke, flashing, banging, and the state I was in, I didn't know what to do for the rest. I could hardly put myself along. I was trying to get somewhere to rest, somewhere quiet, somewhere where I felt safe. I just didn't know what to do, or where to go for the best. I just dragging myself along. There was a chateau and I managed to get into the grounds there and there was a fountain with a, a little angel in the middle and the water coming out. This is where I just parked myself. I got down that side here. I just sat down and I thought I'd get a splash of water, freshen myself if I could with this hand. The water was a lot, it wasn't green. I wouldn't have been bothered there like, you know. And the, and the fountain was working at the time. But I couldn't, do, I couldn't even manage that. I get here and had enough and just passed out here, just sat and then nothing. Be quite honest, I don't know how long it was. I don't know whether the same day, it could have been a fortnight later, you know, it was just the state I was in. And then the next thing, there was a big crash, and I think it was that fine. At the far end, being big iron gates, 
the German tanks came straight through. They stopped about two foot away from me. I thought the damn thing was going to run over me. Anyway, they stopped. And the next minute, these soldiers come running through, told me to get up like, I couldn't do anything. We wanted to grab me like, pull me on my feet. It was rumours amongst the lads. If the Germans caught any prisoners, we were shooting them. So I thought, well, I've no bloody chance. I said, I'm wounded like. And then the big German officer, I rank, spoke perfect English. And uh, he came across, he said, Old you, son. I said, bloody old you'll fight you bees. And he, he looked and he smiled like. He said, for you, the war is over. Not far away, the war was also ending for the rest of the 51st and their French allies. 08.15 hours, a white flag was seen to be fluttering from the steeple of a church about 100 yards from the divisional headquarters. Just 100 yards, I mean, that's no distance at all. Orders were at once issued for the flag to be hauled down and for the discovery and arrest of the person who'd hoisted it. This proved to be a French officer who told Fortune that the French had indeed capitulated. Incredibly, despite the French surrender, General Fortune resolved that the 51st would continue to fight. I've informed the French corps commander that my policy is I cannot repeat not comply with his orders until I am satisfied that there is no possibility of evacuating by boat any of my division later. You know, he's clutching at straws at this point, but what a desperate note to, to write. Eventually, though, at 10.34 a.m., after a volley of shells narrowly missed his headquarters, even Fortune was forced to admit defeat. In Saint-Valéry, here were wesentliche Teile der französischen Nordarmee eingeschlossen. General Fortune, or as some of the lads used to nickname him, Miss Fortune at that time, he had to surrender. The General Fortune said it would just be a mass, mass slaughter. So they decided to surrender, to save the lives of some of the people. Rommel himself accepted the surrender from General Fortune. I remember General Fortune, he sat on the bank and tears rolled down his face. He was broken-hearted General Fortune, who was taken a prisoner with us, but he was the one who gave the order for the 51st to surrender because there was no future for it. When news of the surrender reached the flotilla later that day, Admiral James was devastated. Writing a few days afterwards, he said, a sad and disappointed man writes to you tonight. The 51st Division, one of our very best, are prisoners of war. 11,000 soldiers of the 51st were taken prisoner. They would spend the rest of the war as POWs and not return home until 1945. There were 5,000 injured and over 1,000 killed. The 51st Highland Division was practically wiped out. Their courage and sacrifice never received any official recognition and no campaign medal has ever been awarded. They never even showed any appreciation, did they, from the war office in England for all those who were left behind. On the cliffs above saint valery on coe there is one memorial to the bravery of the 51st. Bravery which had a profound and lasting effect on one Frenchman who fought alongside them. General Charles de Gaulle, who led the Free French, led the, the fight, the continued fight of the French. In the speech he made in Scotland in 1942, he put, for my part, I can say that the comradeship of arms between the French Armoured Division, which I had the honour to command, and the gallant 51st Scottish Division under General Fortune, played its part in the decision which I made to continue the fight at the side of the Allies, to the end, come what may.
I was a mate of mine. We knew each other before the army in the local area where we lived. Active laddie, full of life. Funny lad at times. Times it could be the opposite, but a great friend. Great pal. We always agreed to stick together, no matter what, through thick and thin. And we did. Bless him. It is a honour to be able to come back, pay my respects, not just to Bernard, but to all the lads that were left behind in the division. None of Don's friends from the photograph he took in Scotland before the war ever made it home. Unfortunately, I'm the only one that survived and I was the one that took the photograph. That is why I always try to get to the cenotaph and remember these lads. Not just them, but the rest of the lads that were with us in the 51st. It's a proud division. I'm so proud of the lads. I'm proud of the lads I left behind. They did a grand job under the circumstances. They couldn't have done better. And I still wear my badge with pride. I was proud to be with them. Proud to be one of them. I always will be. I'll never forget them. <laughs>